fine. I would do it, but I have a Chromebook, and for some reason, it doesn't let me record, or when I'm in math class, I can't write on the, using the whiteboard thing, so. Hmm, that's weird. I have to ask other people to do it for me. <laughs> no, you're good. And then, before we get started, when, just because, Rochelle, you have, like, a little bit of background noise, I think we all kind of do, so maybe when, like, somebody's talking, we can just mute, and then let everybody, like, I don't know, go through just to make sure that everybody can hear everything. But I'm just going to reread the question really quick for the sake since we're recording now. So question 2B says, have one person in your group choose a video or website that they would like to watch or peruse from the list. Ideally, each person engages with a different link listed. Which video or link did you engage with and how does it help nuance or make more complex your approach to parent and family engagement? So, Esme, do you want to start first since yours was the first link? Um, yeah. So, I don't know how it would make it much more complex. Um, it's a, so it, basically it's a video, it's based in like Denmark and it's just different groups of people, like people who aren't earn way more money than others and like people who you would consider like, you know, like thugs and whatnot. So it's just different groups of people from different cultures and backgrounds. And they're asking them like community building questions like, oh, like who was considered a class clown or like, it would go from like small questions like that to personal questions like, like who here is bisexual and all those, you know, personal questions. And the whole point was them for all those groups of people to see that they have something in common, like they have some connections and others who don't have connections with in a certain question they might make a connection with someone else in the group when another question is asked so i think we kind of do that in class when we do community when we do the brain breaks we all kind of see how we're all different so i think it's just easier for us to see that we're all different but we also have like these other sections of us that can interconnect and make connections with other kids and students and other people. So I think, I don't know, I don't think it makes it complex. I think it makes it easier because now you get to know people in another level when you, so I don't know, I thought it was interesting because as a person you see other people and you're like, oh, I probably don't have anything in common with them. But if, when you get to know them, you might see that, oh, maybe, at least there's small connections like oh our favorite color is yellow so i don't i think it's helpful for teachers to see that and implement that into the classroom that's super cool because i feel like i would i'd want to do something like that too because it's always good like it's nerve-wracking going into a new class in general even for like me as a college student. And so it'd be nice to be able to kind of find some common ground in the beginning. So I could definitely see myself using that too. So that's cool. Um, Rochelle, did you wanna go next for that second link? Yes, my cat is now up here now. And we need that movement. Okay, um, so I watched the video um, where yes, you're gonna see, you're gonna hear her snorting. I'm sorry. Um, so it's about <laughs> she's really old, and I said she's fat, and she'll probably hear her snort. Um, so I watched a video about a photographer um, that goes around in her communities in different communities of color um, and takes photos. So it, it was actually really interesting because she likes to capture obviously the heart of the community, um, things that aren't really glorified and things that aren't really the best side of it. She likes to um, capture things like um, the architecture and stuff like that, but also um, what is in their community. So she used the example of in her community, there's a lot of liquor stores and there's a lot of um, beauty places that um, women and men can go to, but she likes to capture how that affects the community psychologically. Like if you do see liquor stores everywhere, um, what is that message that you should probably go and drink or you know get that 
um, get the alcohol and kind of, if you see it everywhere, you're gonna wanna go in. Um, she also mentioned beauty stores and how a lot of it is based on, or a lot of it has a lot of chemicals in it. So she was saying how um, that usually, you know, can make younger people believe that you need like chemicals and stuff in your makeup to make you feel beautiful or things like that. So it was really interesting to watch it and kind of made me think when we are teachers to think about what is in our children's community and how does that impact them psycho psychologically um, and things like that. And because sometimes like I have kind of always worked in a far, not not far, far, but in not in my community. I've always had to kind of travel for my school. So to be aware of what's going on in that community and to teach kids the benefits that, you know, the what your community is doing great and can teach you great things, but also the negative side of like, what um, biases does our community teach us and how do we, kind of talk about those issues and stuff like that. So I thought it was really eye-opening to watch. That's really cool too. Um, my video was about um, home visits, which is something that I've always liked the idea of, but um, the video was actually from DPS, so the Denver Public Schools and how they incorporate it. Um, so it's, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but pretty much teachers just m set up meetings to go visit students in their homes, meet their families, see what their home likes life. And it's really cool um, because you're building more of a community outside of the classroom and with parents and families. So you're getting a chance to meet them, understand what the children's background is, understand what their families like. Um, and they were just talking about the benefits of it, like how it helps students to be more engaged in class and helps teachers to better understand student situations. Um, and a lot of the parents were actually interviewed in the video too, and they said that they really enjoyed it because it made them feel like their teachers actually cared. Um, so it was really cool and I could definitely see myself using it in my management plan. I've always liked the idea of it, but yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I've been to um, like a couple home visits and it's actually like really, it is really cool because like you're not really talking about anything academic. You're just like literally like, what does he like to do or she? Like, what do you guys do as family? Like just getting to know them and it's really, really cool. Um, I only went to a couple though and I would like to incorporate that. But I don't know, like, I'm assuming that districts like encourage that, right? Or like what are, cause like I've, every class, every school that I've been to, like nobody really does it. Um, just the one preschool, the very first preschool that I worked with or worked at, they did it, but only one class did. So I didn't know like if it was kind of, if districts encourage that or if it's like, I don't know. I just don't really see many teachers doing that. So I guess my question is just like, why? Cause it's such a good way to connect with families. Um, but I don't know. I didn't know if it was something the district doesn't really allow or I don't know. So it was just a question that I had. Yeah, it didn't really cover how, because I honestly don't know either. I think that that choice is ultimately up to the teachers. I don't think that it would be up to the district. Oh gosh, sorry guys. <laughs> I don't think that they would be the ones who made that ultimate decision, like encouraging everyone to do it. Um, I think it would be up to the teacher themselves and if they want to incorporate that. But I wanted to go kind of backwards a little bit, Rochelle, when you said that the visits weren't talking about academics or school or any of that, because that was a big point that they make. Um, home visits aren't so much like a parent-teacher conference where you're just talking about how the student's doing and this, this, and this. It's more about building like a relationship with students and families. So I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. I think that's something that would need to be researched, but I don't know. I really like it. I don't know why more teachers don't do it either because I think it's really cool. Yeah, and did it go over like, because I've always wondered, we only did it in the beginning of the school year, like before they even came to school. Like, did it mention at all, like, do people do it throughout the year? Like, do they go kind of like the beginning to meet them and stuff and then kind of 
I mean, is that allowed? I don't know. <laughs> like, do you do it throughout the year or is it just a one-time thing? Yeah, I think the one, the video that I watched for the most part, I think it was noting to the beginning of the year, just kind of introducing, but I don't see why not you would, you couldn't continue those um, community building activities. I think that that would be a really good idea too. So I don't know, but I found the video super, super interesting. It's always something, I mean, I think I first learned about it like a, a year, maybe a year and a half ago when I was first in starting at Metro. Um, and ever since it came up, I was like infatuated with it. So yeah, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good idea just because if you get to see their home, it, you also get an idea of like their culture and and what resources they do have available to them. So like, oh, like I realized uh, my student A doesn't have Wi-Fi at home. They don't have technology at home or like anything like that. Maybe they don't have stable housing. And then you can make those connections to how your student performs in schools and how those, what you see at home, how it affects them at school. So I think it's a really good idea. I actually never heard about it. Um, I don't ever remember, but my avid teacher, she was a teacher and she was in a bad neighborhood to go and teach. And then she realized all the problems that the school, the community, the school was placed in. So it was really like eye opening for her because she comes, you know, she's a white, a teacher who lives in like you know uh how, how would I say like in a wealthier neighborhood so coming down to a neighborhood like that was really eye-opening for her so I think it's really important that we get to see like where our school is located and where our kids um are at home where they're living and how it affects them yeah I totally agree and then something else one last thing that I I'm just remembering more things the more we get into the conversation. Um, they said that the home visits have to be voluntary on the family's part. So it's not something that would ever be required or anything like that. Um, they also said that if, if parents or families wanted to meet somewhere other than the home, that that was something that was welcomed as well. So I definitely think that it's kind of like a choice for parents and families, but I think that um, they really just tried to enunciate how effective it can be in helping kids through their school process. So that's something else I just wanted to bring up because I something you said just reminded me of it. Did you guys want to start moving on to number three now about the readings for this week? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to read number three. So discuss this week's reading work. Think about how these readings and media reframe parent or family engagement in ways that you would like to communicate and connect with families in your future classroom. Answers synchronously or asynchronously. I hope I said that right. And the first one, part A, is according to Baker et al., why is parent and family engagement important for student success and what does the research say? So if any of you guys want to chime in, I have something too, but I feel like I'm, I'm talking a lot right now. <laughs> you can start us off. Okay, I'm going to bring up my notes really quick here. So I'm going to actually just share my screen. Oh, Esme, could you give me permission to share it? <laughs> Her cat's so cute. <laughs> Sorry, um, I just made you host because it's okay. not giving me permission. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I just took little quotes from the book. I didn't even cite them correctly, but I just wanted to make sure that I wrote down where I put it and where I found. So um, I found this quote that was saying, increases in frequent and high quality interactions amongst teachers and parents, yielded greater trust and respect, increased social capital for students and provided more support for student success. So 
that was one of the studies that the research said. And then the, this second quote here is kind of what I found about why it's important. So engaged parents have greater educational aspirations for their children. It improves communication with their child. Um, more positive attitude, attitudes towards their child's teacher. Often feel more confident about their abilities to help their children gain a better understanding of both formal and informal rules of the school and develop an appreciation and greater knowledge about the importance of their role in their child's education. So if you guys, that's pretty much what the um, book or the reading was saying, but is there anything that you guys want to add on to that at all? Um, no, I, I remember this part of um, the last one that you just read and it like, it, I feel like it's a hundred percent true, you know, like just um, the engagement and how beneficial it can be for not only the parents, but the student and how well they do in class and um, the connection that it can bring towards the parents and the, and the child. Um, and from just personal experience when I was in ELL, ELL para, um, I, at first I really didn't engage with the parents at all because I was just like, oh, I'm just a para, you know, like I just take them out for 20 minutes or 40 minutes of the day. Like, why would I interact with them? Um, but I, start, I started calling them and letting them know what was going on and things they can do at home. And it just became, I feel like the kids were more willing to come to group. They were more willing to talk to their parents about what was going on. And that communication really brought like all of us together. And it was really awesome to see. So um, the last one that you read really, um, when I was reading resonated with me um, from just personal experience. That's great. Um, so for me, I don't know, I like the, what it was saying for Baker, what he was saying in your last quote. But yet the last quote makes me, again, it just makes me think about immigrant parents and people who have a language barrier. Um, it's just that for me, I don't know, just from personal experience, um, my mom really cares about my education. She's always pushing me to do better, but she doesn't help me with my homework for, you know, obvious reasons like language barrier and her having a different education than I did. So um, it's kind of like when, when it says engaged parents have greater educational aspirations for their children, I can see that, how that helps, but it's also like, oh, okay, but then what about parents who can't really be engaged um, with their students' education and all the assignments they have? But overall, I really like um, that there's actual, you know, like studies on it and there's facts and that are telling you that this will, like, this is an outcome and engaged parents really help improve just communication and the education of children overall. Right, and that actually is a good good way to kind of leeway over to the some of the barriers for um, parent and family engagement. So this is just some of them that I found on 176 and 177. Um, so language barriers was one of the first that it talked about. Time conflicts, transportation, don't wanna participate in background checks, costs of just getting their students involved in sports and stuff is something that um, it mentioned, and then single parent families. So I, I, I wrote down the barriers, but I kind of just wanted to facilitate a discussion about what some solutions might be to address these. So in your case, Esme, you were talking about how your mom couldn't even really communicate due to the language barriers. Is there a solution that you might be able to offer to be able to kind of break that barrier and help her become more involved or families like you who have those language barriers with the parents? Um, so one thing my elementary um, school started to do was we're gonna hold meetings and we're gonna have a translator at these meetings for these parents who can't speak you know English and it wouldn't be like during the time, because it also goes with like time conflicts. 
it would be like, oh, we're gonna meet like around six, so later in the afternoon at this like YMCA um, conference room or just a room in the library or whatever. And they would just translate important things. And I would have a translator there and it was easy for my mom because there was just one translator there and they would provide like um, these hearing aids or something. It's, it was like Bluetooth and she would just, they wouldn't have to wait for the person to stop speaking because the translator is translating as the person is speaking. So I thought it was pretty, it was pretty cool. And I think they, they're still doing that. So I thought it was pretty cool, but I guess it only goes so far because it's only for um, like meetings that they're having instead of like um, sending papers, but sent, the papers were always sent in Spanish if they asked. So they would ask the student like, oh, like what is your family's primary language? And they would try to send out uh, copies of the uh, assignments or whatever in Spanish. So I that think is so cool that that Bluetooth thing that you're talking about. That is super neat that there's there's technology like that to help. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing with time conflicts, um, just from my prior classes, and I'm just making con a connection that some schools could offer like phone calls if there's not a way to actually meet or like how we're doing virtual meetings. So like Skype or Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams. I think that, you know, just as soon as a parent becomes available or the family can take out, you know, 10 minutes of their day to just sit at a computer or a phone or whatever, or the phone call. I think that could definitely help with the time conflicts barrier as well. Rochelle, did you have anything to add on? Maybe you could kind of talk about some solutions for like transportation, for the cost, for background checks, something like that? Um, just, I guess, um, like when I was contacting, like going back to language barriers, like as Mae was talking about, um, when, like all of the parents, all of the families that I had for ELL, um, they spoke different language. So um, we use, I use translators all the time and we were able to communicate well, well with that. Um, yeah. um, so like with time conflicts, that's one thing that I think is the hardest because and not only time conflicts, but like parents just not answering their phones or e answering the emails, um, things like that were really tough. But I do agree like I did a lot of um, virtual meetings and I guess that goes with transportation too. Um, it is really hard um, when they don't have transportation. I mean, they can't go anywhere. It, it would have to be phone call or um, virtual. But like I was saying, like apps like Class Dojo and stuff is great for communication. Unfortunately, like there's not a way that I know of on Class Dojo that can translate. So that is really difficult, um, but just having that constant um, talk and communication, like email, call, uh, virtually meeting, um, is the only thing that I can really think of for transportation. Um, like obviously, they could take like a bus and other like w ways like that, but it's hard. Some people just they have to meet like after after work hours and stuff like that. So transportation can be hard. So I would just say kind of what you were saying, Emma, a virtually meeting or um, phone calls and stuff like that is the only thing I can really think of for solutions. Yeah, and I think even going with transportation, if they can't come to us, then maybe we can go to them as well. Um, that could definitely help out because I think that, I mean, our, this entire task for this week is talking about parent involvement and how beneficial it can be. So I think that with these barriers, it's kind of the teacher's responsibility to do everything in their power to kind of break them down and be able to involve parents because we do see like how beneficial it is. So I don't um, my, my question though, because I know with the, um, the district that I did home visits for a couple of them, um, we could not do it out after school hours. So I wonder how that would, because we had, it was preschool, so they started later than the rest of the school. So 
um, we had to do it during work hours. So I wonder if that would be like, if that is across the board, like I get it if we go like after five and something happens, you know, or like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I wonder what those would be like, if we would be able to go to their house after school hours or a contracted time. I don't know. I just know for that district, they didn't think they didn't allow that, but um, that is a really good solution. If we could um, meet them, so not meet them, but go to them so that we could have meetings and stuff would be a good idea. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I've, I'm going to stop sharing, by the way, because I think that we've covered that, but I don't know how that works. I, I'm, I haven't had a job in education yet, so I'm not familiar with the policies and stuff like that, but I don't know. I, I just think that if it's not something you can go home after hours, then maybe, I mean, the only option you could do would be a phone call or a virtual meeting. Sorry, I had to cough and I didn't want to blow up you guys <laughs> with that. Um, I saw, sorry, I saw another barrier um, and I think it was just um, parents um, having a negative experience in schools where it affects them so much they don't even want to attend the schools their children are going to and I think that's another barrier because I because if you don't feel welcome you know when you were a kid then you don't think your kids are going to feel welcome to when they go to school so I just wanted to point that one out <laughs> sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you um was that reading that we did that one time? I'm, I have like four classes, so I don't know if it was this class, but um, when they were talking about how the teacher like changed her name and like, um, like she, it was a name that she couldn't pronounce, so she gave her an easier name. Uh, was that this class? Probably not. Um, I don't think so, but I've seen articles about it lately on social media about things happening just like that. Yeah. So, there, so there's just basically like opting out of their name and just giving them their own name. Right. So like it was, so it was an article. It was, in, it was in one of my books um, about this girl who was in, I think, I don't know what grade I want to say like third or something. And she had a very Hispanic name and she, her teacher couldn't pronounce it. So she decided to give her like an easier name. So like, it was like, I don't know if it was her middle name. I don't even think it had any association to do with what her name was. And she was like, I'm just gonna call you that because it's a lot easier. And that was like the moment that she remembers as even as an adult of like somebody taking her culture away. And like the parents didn't want to um, even go to the school anymore because she, kind of didn't celebrate her name and her culture and the parents didn't want anything to do with the teacher or the school because they were very upset that they did that. Um, and even to this day, I, she's an adult and she still thinks about that. And now her friends call her that name, like even as an adult, like it's stuck with her and like nobody calls her by her name, only her family. So I thought that was really interesting. Like how things like that can um, cause the parents and the family to disconnect from schools, um, like not celebrating their culture or their name or um, things like that, and to be mindful of how you approach students and to kind of celebrate their culture in a way. So that might, reminded me of what, what you just said, so. That blows my mind, that's insane. That's really sad too because culture is such a big part of people's lives and it's supposed to be celebrated, especially in schools. Everybody should feel included and safe in schools and we're taking it away by making it easier for ourselves. Like that just sounds disgusting to me personally. So that's awful. Okay, so I know we don't have much time left in this meeting, so let's just try to briefly go over the last one and it looks like we're just talking about our classroom management plan a little bit, um, but all that she's really looking for for that one is um, looking through those links or videos um, based on the readings, videos, links, or personal experiences. Have one person suggest one tool or strategy that they'd like to use in their classroom management plan. 
So did you guys get the chance to watch any of those videos or links from that? Um, there's one of this teacher where she just has her whole classroom set up. But I think the biggest one for me is just the where they have the community circles and they just have their morning meetings. Um, I think a lot of teachers do that now just because when I've gone into classrooms, I see that. So I think that's one thing I'll implement into mine. I don't know if you guys have started your management planning, but there's a website called Floor Plan Creator. And that's what I've been using. So um, I just wanted to let you guys know because I, if you guys don't want to do it on paper, you can just do it online and you can just make your own classroom in there. You said floor plan creator? Yeah, and it's called, okay. it has dot .net. Dot .net? Start it. Perfect, yeah, I'll definitely look at that. And then really quick, I just wanted to bring up one of the videos that I watched on accident. <laughs> the one that I sent in the group chat, but it was the number strategy. And I thought that one was a really cool idea. They basically just assigned the students numbers and then used those numbers throughout the whole school year so people could go grab their Chromebooks and it had their number so they knew right where it was. Um, she would randomly assign numbers together and then it would randomly assign to students and group work. So I just thought that was really cool too. She said that it helped teach them accountability, responsibility, and kind of gave them a place in the classroom. So that was one that I really thought was a good one to incorporate myself as well. All right, guys. Well, I think that that's probably covering it. Rochelle, Esme, is there anything else we want to cover? I know I feel like I've been talking so much, but I know that I haven't. I just feel like I have. So anything else you guys want to add before we wrap it up? I don't think so. I think we've, I think I, we've covered it. I don't know. I don't think so. I think that's it. Okay, perfect.